Hello class, today's lecture will be an introduction and key concepts in ethnomusicology. This corresponds with chapter one of the textbook. Now in this lecture, we're going to discuss and determine proper definitions for some terms. Any textbook or academic discipline that aims to engage with a wide variety of musical traditions from around the world very quickly finds itself confronting fundamental problems regarding how to define concepts such as sameness and difference, quote unquote world music, and even how to conceptualize music as a whole, like defining what makes music. While each individual might have their own seemingly common sense understanding of what these concepts mean, they vary radically from culture to culture and across time periods within cultures. And the more musical traditions we take into consideration, the less workable these seemingly straightforward definitions become. Many world music textbooks thus begin by contemplating how we might create working definitions for these terms that are specific enough or meaningfully useful, but broad and flexible enough to function the world over, or at least to set us up for understanding rather than misunderstanding. So our introduction today will bring us into these definitional problems, lay out some of the contradictions and oversights of some seemingly common sense ideas about music and cultural difference, summarize some of the ways in which recent scholarship has dealt with these problems, and ultimately stake out both a working definition for music and a basic method for musical inquiry. Our study will actually begin with examining a vignette of a concert at the Mann Center in Philadelphia. So this was an outdoor venue in a public park in Philadelphia and the author of our textbook attended an event with his daughter. There were two performing groups in the concert. The first was Lady Smith Black Mombazo, and the second group was the Blind Boys of Alabama. Now, Lady Smith Black Mombazo is an African a cappella group who perform in a style from South Africa called Isikatamiya. And the Blind Boys of Alabama are a gospel group that was founded in 1939. Now the author of our textbook, Timothy Rahman, uses this event as a point of entry into a discussion on how sameness and difference enter into the study of ethnomusicology and of world music. Both groups are extremely famous around the world for what they do. They are Grammy winners and they tour internationally. Let's watch a little bit of the performance of each group. Try to move my screen around.
Okay, that's just a sampling of this performance. You can watch the rest of it by clicking one of the links in Blackboard. Oh, sorry about that. I'm gonna listen to it again. Let's go on to the next one. Now let's listen to a little bit of the Blind Boys of Alabama. There's a sample of the second group, Blind Boys of Alabama. So as we go through this, um, try to think about the different sounds that you heard and things that you noticed, and we'll talk about it in a little bit. So the next question I want to put to you is what is world music? And there really are two different notions of what this term is about. The first is the, what the music industry tends to classify as world music, which is anything that falls outside the North Atlantic popular classical or traditional realms or anything that's not sung in English using this catch-all term. In this sense, the term world music is ethnocentric as this concert shows with the two different groups, there is no quality of worldness that certain styles possess, but others lack. Rather, this is a definition based primarily on the position of the person or the group doing the defining. And while everyone might have a perspective, and while this culturally specific perspective might be useful to um, each individual's daily encounters with music, it becomes problematic when such a situated perspective is taken as universal, objective, or standard or mainstream. Let me move my, move my picture around here. So another issue with this notion of world music is that it has a delimiting effect, which goes to say it creates a single category for all of the world's music that does not fit into a very small set of criteria, like sung in English, from a, a North Atlantic nation state, or performed using conventions from those areas. In addition, this definition inscribes difference, otherness, and sometimes exoticism in the musical traditions that it describes. It marks styles by what they are not such as Western, in relation to a set of styles that are implicitly counted as normative. So our author of this textbook does not share the same view of this definition of the term world music. It reflects a way of thinking about the world that we just don't share. So um, Raman developed an alternative definition that we'll get into. So Raman indicates that this alternative notion of world music opens the world to new sounds, new encounters, and new possibilities. He develops this notion by way of contrast to the first. 
So difference is at the center of the first definition. and many traditional studies of non-Western music. Difference is a quantifiable reality of performance, practice, and sound. It becomes easy to overdetermine and essentialize. Let's look at some of the differences between the two performing groups that we listen to. First, Lady Smith Black Mombaza, they sing softly. There's a, the particular style is called Isikatamiya, and it, this is derived from Zulu and means something like walk softly. The original performers of this style were migrant mine workers in South Africa in the early 20th century. They lived in mine barracks and they would participate in after hours singing and dancing. These activities needed to be soft because camp security prohibited it. Their songs use what's called cellular construction and that means there's little segments that are repeated. This is a very common structure throughout sub-Saharan African music. Lady Smith also performs a cappella, which means without instruments, just singing voices. And instruments would have been impractical in its original context, so that's part of how it was developed. Lastly, Lady Smith Black Mombaza sings primarily in African languages, although the example that I played for you does have some English. The primary languages are Zulu and Sutu. Now let's look at Blind Boys of Alabama. In contrast, they sing quite loudly. And part of this is because this is a gospel style of singing. And gospel is rooted in the notion of proclamation. It's meant to be disseminated broadly. As far as the form, instead of a cellular construction, we have a verse chorus form, which would be very familiar to people in West, the West. It's a North American form of music that's popular in um, religious and popular traditions of music. They, they are not performing a cappella. They have a backing band, a gospel band, which is derived from its church context. And they sing primarily in English. So let's go through it, um, an explanation of this second definition of world music. Our first definition of world music, or non-Western music, might hold that the Blind Boys of Alabama are more normative and Lady Smith Black Mombaza as other. A more productive way of looking at difference acknowledges that both perceptions of what is the same and different and perceptions of the relevance of these differences are matters of perspective. So a key phrase to remember from the textbook. Difference can enable us to see and hear ourselves in the other and the other in ourselves. This is especially the case if we approach these musical encounters open to the possibility that our own perspective is subject to reinterpretation and to change in the face of new experiences. Combined with a decentering of your own experiences, an examination of difference can lead to mutual exchange and open encounter. So the exploration of difference from this perspective can illuminate commonalities, solidarity, and shared horizons. It allows us to see and hear ourselves in the other and the other in ourselves. So let's look at the commonalities between these groups who have very different um, characteristics of music. So both groups overcame inequality related to race and class. Lady Smith Black Mombaza formed during the worst years of the apartheid regime. The Blind Boys of Alabama performed throughout the Jim Crow era and the Civil Rights Movement. 
both groups were affected by the legacy of colonialism. Lady Smith performed uh, during a time of colonial subjugation and apartheid in South Africa. And the blind boys of Alabama are, their history is from the West African slave trade and the Southern plantation economy. Both groups mobilize music as a source of power to confront local struggles. Both groups have benefited from the long-term exchange of musical practices back and forth across the Atlantic. And both groups have remained committed to their traditions while collaborating with artists outside these traditions. In this sense, analysis of difference leads back to an appreciation of shared human concerns commonalities and parallel histories. So this book will approach the concept of world music by seeing different difference and commonality as matters of perspective and emphasis and highlights the sheer diversity of the world's musical tradition as well as the overlaps, shared horizons, and common concerns that undergird this diversity. Okay. The next question we have, which I opened too soon, sorry about that, is defining music itself. What is music? And this is for the purpose of looking at more globally how we can define music. So we start with the definition from Webster's New World Dictionary, a source that we might think would take a straightforward, objective, and authoritative approach to show how situated, incomplete, and arbitrary even such common sense definitions can be. So what is music? It's a deceptively complex question. Here are the two definitions offered in the textbook. From Webster's New World Dictionary, music is the art of combining tones to form expressive compositions. Two, music is such compositions. And three, any rhythmic sequence of pleasing sounds. Bruno Nettle, who was a pioneer in ethnomusicology, offered just this simple definition. Music is a group of sounds. Later on, he has elaborated, to be properly understood, music should be studied as a group of sounds, as behavior that leads to these sounds, and as a group of ideas or concepts that govern the sound and the behavior. Now, Webster's dictionary definition evokes concepts of composition, time, and aesthetics in ways that are particular to a specific context are predicated on a set of supposedly shared assumptions and are quickly revealed as problematic when extended to the world beyond that context. Raman touches on some of the multitude of ways in which these concepts can be defined differently in different cultural contexts and thereby shows the limitations of this definition. The point of this exercise is not to criticize Webster's Dictionary, but rather to expand your thinking beyond common handed down categories for thinking about music. This is an important prerequisite for approaching the material that we're going to see in later chapters. So let's look at each of these categories. Okay, let's go with composition. Remember, Webster's Dictionary, the art of combining tones to form expressive compositions and such compositions show up. These are the concepts of composition in the Webster's Dictionary definition. Raman, however, defines as the combination of musical elements that somehow forms a logical whole, a unit of some sort. So composition is one of the most ubiquitous ideas in music but there's many ways to define it. In Western classical music, we define composition as written down or autographed scores. In other traditions, it's not written down. Um, or they're called oral traditions. They're much more prevalent than written ones in music. 
such as the Trinidadian Calypso. Compositions can be well known and standardized, but are almost never written down. As far as the nuts and bolts of the music, the scalar concepts, scales and concepts, other performance practices within a, a given culture, shape the concept of what constitutes a musical composition. So as, as a whole, each of those cultures define that. The Makam system, for example, the gamelan tuning systems, and throat or overtone singing are some examples from the textbook. Music's function in society also shapes concepts of composition and of music itself. The sounds that we interpret as musical can mean radically different things and can be put into intensely divergent purposes. Approaching musics of other cultures only from our own perspective can only serve to limit understanding of this diversity. The Quranic recitation serves as a case in point from the textbook. We come to a clearer understanding of what a particular example of music is by approaching it via the study of the people who produce it and the culturally specific values and practices that lead to its production. The merits of Nettles' definition over those of Webster's dictionary come to light as we engage with more and more of this diversity. A great quote from the chapter uh, is, these musical specifics are best explored through encounter rather than delineated at the outset. So ethnography or field work is knowledge gained through in-person experience within a context where music is produced. That is at the center of this kind of study and forms the basis for the knowledge and perspectives that appear in this book. All right, the next category of defining music is time. It shows up in Webster's definition as any rhythmic sequence. Time is uh, there's a relativistic approach to this concept of time as many others the basic proposition is there's cultural relativism there are no universal scientific or objective ways of conceptualizing music musical quality or other core concepts such as time everyone holds certain concepts about the passage of time and musical value to be true there's nothing inherently wrong with these concepts, but all of them are, to a certain extent, arbitrary rather than neutral or objective. All of them come out of a particular, culturally specific way of encountering the world. All of them orient you toward one particular interpretation of the world around you over another. Each society evaluates music by its own set of criteria. You will put yourself in a position to understand the music and the musicians better if you attempt to interpret particular performances based on these criteria rather than your own preconceived notions of musical quality. And dogmatic adherence to rigid external criteria can prohibit sensitive, meaningful analysis and understanding. There is no objective basis from which to claim that a certain culture, perspective, or musical tradition is better or worse than another. This is not an attempt to invalidate your opinion, make you like something that you don't, or to insist that you feel a certain way about certain music. Rather, it's good to notice that your own perspective extends only as far as your own subjectivity. Western music tends to be organized in a linear fashion. This includes classical and popular music. We have an example in the textbook about the form of a rock song with the verse and the chorus and the bridge and so on. Other cultures have different structures and treatments of time. In South and Southeast Asia, the linear progression of pieces is overlaid on a cyclical structure and treatment of time. He also develops an example in the book through a description of Hindustani Tala and Cosmological Associations for Ragas. 
Aboriginal Australians have a completely different sense of cosmological time, and it relates directly to their musical performance. Based on these considerations, Nettle's broad definition has less potential to mislead you on the concept of time in music than the Webster's Dictionary definition. And the last category of defining music through aesthetics and culture, we see in the Webster's Dictionary, it shows up with qualitative words such as expressive compositions and pleasing sounds. Unlike the first two concepts of composition and time, which are concerned with the sound and structure of music, aesthetics is ultimately bound up in the tastes and values of a particular community or society. To deal with the idea of aesthetics is to raise the question of how to define culture. So this concept of culture, when taken as innate or together with uncritical notions of difference, it's used to justify inaction in the face of human rights abuses. It's used to advocate neo-colonialism and war. And it's used to naturalize power hierarchies, such as in thinking of civilized versus savage, or first world versus third world. So we challenge this oversimplified notion that there are homogenous, geographically circumscribed, and monolithic social groups around the world as implied by an uncritical adoption of the term culture. But we don't want to reject the notion of culture out of hand. Within an artistic community, there can be broad disagreement about what is beautiful, meaningful, or authentic in music. These concepts are always negotiated in practice and often fiercely contested. Imagine multiplying this internal subcultural diversity to the scope of the entire world and it becomes clear why the concept of unified culture and cultural areas does not hold up to scrutiny. Rather than treating culture as static, unified, our authors believe dynamics of cultural motion, change, and fluidity should be the norm. And so we focus on these instead. A range of forces and prior concepts cause global, multi-directional change. Ethnicity, technology, finance, media, and ideas or ideology. This approach better explains the forms of expression we see around us. And we have examples in the textbook of popular music from around the world to illustrate. Now, as we return to a definition of music, there's no room for my face. <laughs> Nettle's definition allows us to arrive at understanding through encounter rather than creating an inflexible set of principles at the outset. And our author, Raman, combines Nettle's definition with one from Martin Stokes. Music, being a group of sounds, is what any social group considers it to be. That's better. Okay, the next segment of our lecture is about a model for studying musical cultures. We're going to draw on Alan Merriam's three-part model for musical analysis. So who is that? Alan Merriam is one of the major figures in ethnomusicology. He argued that musical analysis should have three dimensions, sound, behavior, and conception. Now sound. Sound can encompass any of the following, instruments, tuning systems, rhythmic ideas, ensembles, genres, styles, vocal timbre, language use, etc. Now, if there's any words that I'm using in this lecture that don't make sense to you, please check out the music fundamentals guide that I posted in Blackboard. It'll have definitions and help you just have a rough idea of what these terms are. Okay, um, sound also it involves uh, the Sox and Hornbostel's musical instrument classification system. It's a way to 
group like instruments together for understanding. So we've got aerophones, chordophones, idiophones, membranophones, and electrophones. And phone, uh, just think of that as root word of sound, right? Pho phonics is tone, sound. So aerophones, I like to think of air or wind. So these are the flute-like instruments, the trumpet-like instruments, and the reeds. Chordophones, okay, what makes chords? I, I think of maybe like a guitar or something that has strings. So zithers and lutes. Idiophones, idio as meaning self, um, self-sounding, so the whole object is vibrating. It's, so this can be rattles or shakers, gongs, or even xylophones. Xylophone is struck with a, a little mallet, but it vibrates as a whole, and that's what produces the sound. And then membranophones, they have membrane, literally on some, these are drums. Drums will have like a skin of some kind stretched over something to make the sound, so membranophones. And electrophones, this is a more recent or, um, classification, and obviously as technology has improved, we've added this classification. This involves electronics, synthesizers, computers, and more categories and subcategories are likely to be added to this as people create, consume, and receive music via digital platforms in new ways. Okay, the next dimension of music is in behaviors. So this means uh, how are people interacting with sound and each other during musical performances? What are the performance contexts? And where is the music happening? And what are the conventions governing interactions? In some types of music, they are strictly religious or sacred ceremonies. Sometimes it's for certain celebrations, that kind of thing. So behaviors. And lastly, conceptions about music. And this is the most abstract dimension of study. And this is about what music is and what it does. Concepts about time and composition, aesthetics, philosophy, ideology, theology, nationalism, ethnic identity, and ownership all are part of this conception about music. Some general notes and observations about these three realms sound, behaviors, and conceptions, they're always going to be interrelated. New interactions generate new sounds that in turn push musical performance into new ideological spaces. And the study of any one of these three dimensions of music is always interdisciplinary. Studies of sound, for example, may enter into dialogue with research from new media studies or sound studies. Studies of musical behaviors might converse with research from religious studies, gender studies, or post-colonial studies. Studies about conceptions can interface with an even wider range of disciplines. So this approach that's laid out by Miriam and that we advocate here leads to a very different kind of analysis and the course format that we're going to use while canonically oriented texts trace the history of pieces of music and end up focusing primarily on specific composers, ideas, and innovations, our class is going to adopt Merriam's approach and will interrogate what musical works and traditions mean for specific groups of listeners at specific times and places. So that's what I have for today. And if you would please go ahead and read the textbook chapter one and listen to the full performances of um, Lady Smith, Black Mombasa and the Blind Boys of Alabama, you can proceed to the next part of the course. Thank you.